All right, well, I will get us started. If the speakers could hit mute, we'll do a little introduction and um, orientation for our guests, and then we'll get started. Well, first of all, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is the Anderson Ranches Thinker Thursday. Uh, we're really excited to gather everyone here. We've had two of these on the campus uh, previous uh, to the uh, COVID outbreak. We had great audiences, um, 100, 125 people in Shermer Meeting Hall makes a really good party. But frankly, we have more people uh, in the room uh, virtually here, and I'm, I'm really excited about that. And thank you all uh, for joining us. Uh, the ranch has a, a ton of things going on, um, really moving forward. Uh, over the past few weeks, we've had two virtual uh, art salons, averaging 50 to 70 people uh, during those programs. Andrea Wallace uh, presented one. Uh, the second one was uh, Leah Agater. Uh, she's on the call today. Uh, she, hers was earlier this week on Tuesday. Uh, Leah's talk was recorded and it's now up on our website. So you can check that out there. I'd also love to give a quick shout out to Leah. Uh, she was featured in the Aspen Times uh, uh, newspaper this morning. I'd like to say it was the front page, but I'm looking at it digitally, so I don't know what the front page is anymore. But Leah um, immediately jumped on the opportunity to convert our digital fabrication uh, equipment at the ranch uh, during the shutdown to, uh, to make medical protective equipment. Uh, she's got a lab set up in her apartment, so she's honoring the stay-at-home order. But just really excited about uh, Leah's leadership of the ranch. It's really just a cool thing, so a quick shout out to her. Um, we will have two upcoming events um, that I can announce now. Our next art salon will be Louise Delaway. She is uh, going to talk on Tuesday, April 21st, next Tuesday at 4 p.m. These are kind of artist presentations of their work. They've been really well received, and we're really excited about it. Uh, again, next Thursday, I'm sorry, next third Thursday, we will do another Thinker Thursday. Uh, so please uh, keep out for uh, an eye out for that as well. Um, watch our social media. We're adding more events all the time. Just, just really excited about that. A lot of questions about what the ranch is doing and how we're responding to the, to the COVID crisis. Uh, so I'm going to kind of give you the inside scoop quick. Uh, one is uh, we're moving a lot of classes online. Uh, we're really excited about it. The, the faculty are the same great faculty we've always had, same small class sizes we've always had, uh, and same student interaction and one-on-one -on -one attention that the ranch has always been famous for. So we're really excited. The classes are smaller than uh, they were here on campus and uh, the cost is lower. So uh, sign up, you're really, you're really gonna love it. I think the other thing you're really gonna love is um, it's the ranch, we're gonna be here next summer. We're gonna be open for business. Uh, it'll be different. We're gonna have more um, shorter format events, different ways for people to engage, but we'll be here, we'll be making art on the ranch. Uh, especially excited um, that we'll be opening the new digital fabrication lab. Uh, we had a donor uh, provide a half a million dollar grant. I think we've blown through about half of that money buying new toys for Leah's uh, studio there. But really, you're going to want to come and check it out. So we look forward to seeing you uh, here at the ranch uh, this summer. Um, it, it probably goes without saying, but it's my role to say it. So I'm also going to add um, the ranch's success really depends on the support of friends and that support of friends during good times and bad. So please consider joining our alumni association. Uh, consider supporting our spring appeal. Uh, the last um, federal uh, tax relief offered um, a, uh, a, 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 um, a tax benefit for anyone that made donations up to $300 to help keep nonprofits running through this difficult time. So uh, you make a huge difference. Uh, what you do is really important to the rest. So please think about uh, supporting us. Uh, some quick ground rules about today and we can get started. Uh, Thinker Thursdays was designed to bring kind of all creatives uh, to the ranch. Uh, people are engaged across different ideas and different interests. And what we've really found fascinating is how often uh, people we didn't know uh, were obsessed with the sex lives of fruit flies and until we saw their presentation, we didn't know. So um, think about um, these events as really a way for us to, to spark creativity with each other. Uh, with each other and to really learn more about the ranch community. Uh, each speaker has 15 slides. They get 15 seconds to speak per slide. Um, their name will pop up first and they get a chance to quickly introduce themselves. Uh, we ask them to keep that very short because we have emailed you full bios of each of the participants uh, speaking today. Um, if you registered early enough, if you registered in the last 15 minutes, you may have missed that, but we will send it in a follow-up email uh, so that you can again see it. These are really interesting people. You're going to want to follow them on social media and you're going to want to uh, keep in touch with them. So 
uh, please look out for those bios in your inbox. Uh, as for the audience, uh, sit back, uh, enjoy yourselves. Uh, hopefully you got a glass of wine or a, or a beer, it's almost cocktail hour. But uh, we're gonna run through all of the presentations back to back, and then we'll have some Q&A at the very end. There are two different ways to participate in the, in the questions and answers at the end. Uh, you'll see at the bottom of your screen, uh, there's a, a Q&A button. So you can uh, hit that and enter a question. And I will moderate some of those questions at the end after uh, starting off the Q&A myself. Uh, you can also raise your hand. Again, if you look on the bottom of your screen, there's a way to raise your hand. Uh, Esther controls your, uh, your access. So she will turn you on. Uh, and that way you can ask those questions directly at the, at the end of the program. Um, all right, really ex uh, excited. I guess my last note is, um, as you've heard me say on campus, uh, questions start with my question is, if you have a speech to make, send us an email and we will uh, get your 15 slides and you'll get your 15 seconds per slide at a future Thursday. So please help us by keeping the questions quick, direct them to someone and please tell us your name uh, when you ask that question. I think that gets us started, so I can pass over to Leah to put up our first, uh, our first set of slides and we will get going. But thank you all for joining us. We're really excited to have 150, 60 people online today. Hi, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Wendy Babcox. I have been a student and I've taught classes at the ranch and I've also been a visiting artist and I just want to say thanks to the faculty and staff there for inviting me to uh, take part today. And I'm ready to roll. Okay, so um, I am a member of uh, an art space in Tampa. It's uh, an artist run collective space and it's called Kunsthaus. And as you can probably imagine, the uh, letters have been arranged, rearranged at times. Um, I decided I wanted to start drum lessons at the space to make it a little bit more, um, I don't know, energized in terms of uh, community programming. And so I started this thing originally called Monday Drum Day. This is our first lesson and uh, we hired a woman who graduated from the School of Music at USF and she's a, a percussionist. And so she came and this is our very first lesson. Uh, we quickly moved from just using the drum pads uh, to including drum machines and electronic beats. And the whole time we're working, the gallery uh, has this sort of ever-changing environment that we're working in. But really and truly, what I wanted to do was learn to play the drum set. And I think it's kind of funny. I'm 55 years old, 56, in fact. And I think it's kind of funny to be in my mid-50s trying to learn to play drums. And I'm excited about being a grandmother that can do that. We started to put on performances as the uh, collective Noisy Women in, uh, in January 2018, and uh, it caused quite a stir in town. Uh, this is one of our guest performers at that event. Uh, her name's Ryan Slauson, and we flew her down for uh, the performance, and she did uh, spoken word and percussive kind of a uh, performance, along with um, a whole group of other uh, women that play in bands locally. This is our collective playing uh, bucket drums. It, we, we sort of learned uh, little cadences at first, and, um, and then this is our event last year. Uh, where we, um, we had two galleries, um, three drum sets. Uh, we had a 12 foot marimba and um, a, a whole setup with looping drum machines. Um, I'm actually a photographer, interestingly. Um, that's kind of my background. And so I felt a responsibility to pull this uh, drum passion back into my artistic practice. And so I started to make cyanotypes of my first drum set. And I was kind of interested in like the indexical, you know, like placing of my drums right onto the photo paper and exposing them in the Florida sunshine. And they're all named after moon events. Um, so <laughs> I, it wasn't enough to learn to play drums. I needed to learn how to make them. And so last summer with absolutely no experience in the wood shop, uh, previously, I learned how to make a stave uh, snare drum, 
And uh, this is a picture of the jig that I made with the drum sitting inside it. And it can turn on those uh, uh, little bearings there while I smooth the surface um, using a router. Uh, this whole thing takes about four weeks, but it ends up like this. And um, so now I'm making my own snare drums and um, I've made uh, about four so far. And um, I just make the whole thing and then put the hardware on afterwards. And then this is sort of, it's culminated in this. So I'm now proposing to make a monster drum set for an exhibition here in Tampa in uh, next summer. And um, I'm, I'm planning to, yeah, rip it up. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Oh, good to go. Okay, Leah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you. I was moved to create this series after reading articles about the devastating statistics of murdered and missing Native American women in this country. I'm creating a series about social change and activism to shine a light on this issue. I use safe source butterflies to create portraits of missing, murdered, domestically abused Indigenous women. The first portrait here is Bam Jane Doe. Her remains were found in 1979. It could be a victim of the Highway of Tears. The second portrait is Pima County Jane Doe, and her body was found 10 miles southeast of Tucson, Arizona. Every single culture for the past 20,000 years has a deep psychological connection to the butterfly and the enigma surrounding it. For the third portrait, I was moved by the interview with Carolyn Felicity Antone, a Tohono O'odham reservation rape survivor. Instead of taking her own life, she started a nonprofit to help other young Native women who have been abused or in abusive relationships. I contacted her and explained the project. She agreed and was very supportive. I continue to work with Carolyn and her nonprofit organization, which is called Young Women Are Sacred. The butterfly represents metamorphosis, fragility, beauty, joy, resurrection, and hope. The medium projects the content of the portrait itself. About 500 pieces of wings were used to create the portrait. Once completed, I photographed the object with great detail. This way it acts as a precious object and a large scale photograph. Here we see the finished portrait with transmitted light, as in light is going through the wings. This is when light becomes a crucial component of the series. How do I display the beauty of the wings with transmitted light and reflected light? This is the same portrait with reflected light, as in light is bouncing off the wings. But how do you display both light sources? These are questions I ask myself all the time as I'm working on the light. Rebecca Plenty Wounds was murdered on the Wind River Reservation in October 2017, and the case is still open. I contacted her sister who sent me her photograph. From this personal photograph, I created this portrait. The Highway of Tears is a series of murders and disappearances of indigenous women in British Columbia from 1970 until the present. This is Ava Sarah Kagura. Her body was found in February 2006 along the stretch of highway. Through my research, I connected with Rosetta Pita, shown here, an activist who is also a survivor. It was important not only to focus on the deceased, but also the survivors of these situations. That portrait is six inches by eight inches. To finish the work, I used Arduino and electrical skills, program microcontrollers to control an LED light panel. The panel is on a cycle to slowly fade on and fade off. The light acts conceptually like a candle. This is the final portrait in a wooden frame with the LED light panel and microcontrollers encased behind glass. You see, I believe that these portraits are turning hard psychological truths into messages of change and beauty. Always explore technology and art. Be open to nature and find the medium that will align with your message. Thank you. Hello, folks. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, 
I'm Ed Cashy. I'm uh, in my home studio in Montclair, New Jersey, just right outside of New York City. Um, as a photojournalist and a documentarian, I've been grounded pretty much for the last five weeks. And so uh, for me, what's so important is to be engaged with the world. It's why I wanted to do this work all my life. And so the two ways I found, well, three ways in, in the current crisis, uh, pandemic is volunteering at a local food kitchen. Um, photographing uh, what I'm calling uh, rising to the call, people who are volunteering or doing amazing things right around me in New Jersey. And then what I'm going to show you here is a personal diary. Let it rip. So, um, you know, this has been an interesting time for many people. Thank you. Uh, so that's our Amazon uh, uh, delivery guy, or one of them. Uh, this was about four or five weeks ago uh, at the very, very beginning. And again, these guys, these people are heroes and are really taking a risk. What I'm trying to do in this diary is record what I'm seeing when I'm out and about. Uh, this was at a, a food uh, drop at a, uh, at a school, a middle school in Montclair. Uh, we have a quite a diverse population here. There are a lot of folks who are middle and low income. Uh, this is a, a neighbor with a good sense of humor. And uh, again, in this diary, I, again, I'm trying to capture some of what's actually going on, but then some of the things I might overlook in, in the rush of my daily life, normal daily life. Um, uh, my wife, who is a total hero, Julie, um, as she said to me about a week ago, she looked me in the eye and she said, I was made for this moment. And uh, so here she's doing online yoga. Um, has, this is Alison Nordstrom, dear friend, amazing curator. Uh, I recorded these as I was having a conversation with her. You know, again, a reminder of how important it is to stay in touch with people, especially people who are living alone. So self-portrait of me. Uh, don't take many pictures of myself, but, uh, you know, there are just these moments where it just feels right to capture my mood and the light was beautiful. I wonder how many people all over the world are, are keeping diaries. Uh, this is the rail line to New York City. It's only 12 miles away, but man, these days it feels like an insurmountable distance. Uh, you know, New York is at the epicenter. I'm living, uh, New Jersey is the second hardest hit uh, state in the country. This was a, a, a FaceTime call with my family. My son is in San Francisco. My daughter's in Ann Arbor, Michigan. That's my wife. It sucks to be so separated from them. Every morning I wake up, can I smell? Can I breathe okay? Do I have a cough? Do I have a fever? And then I embrace the day. This was a gorgeous uh, dawn. Many mornings I'm waking up early, anxious about getting sick. Brenda Bingham, my studio manager and my second brain, she can't come anymore to our home studio, so I miss her terribly, but uh, she had come to drop off a hard drive, and this was about as close as she was willing to get. So again, because I am going out most days. This is my wife, uh, she's sewing masks for people, she's knitting, she's planting her garden. It's really obnoxious how amazing she is, but uh, I'm so fortunate to, to have a mate like her. That's a mask that, uh, actually my sister sewed that mask for me, but uh, this is just a moment after I'd come back from working in the field. Uh, I did desanitize before I kissed her though. Um, and this is at the food kitchen that I'm uh, volunteering at, it's called Tony's Kitchen. And uh, they, they uh, prepare thousands of meals a week for uh, schools, uh, low-income people, uh, working poor, you know, just people in need, and, and we've seen it rise. A week and a half ago, our neighbor from across the street died, a, a, man, a father in his early 60s. It was an amazing moment where about 30 or 40 of us came out at noon and held a vigil uh, as his wife came out to leave for the funeral. It was, uh, everyone was just sobbing. And two days later, in the exact same spot, our neighbor's four-year-old had a birthday party, and somehow his parents got Darth Vader to show up. So I love this uh, circle, cycle, circle of life. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm John Seibold. I'm a uh, recovering uh, engineer and part-time furniture maker living here in Aspen. Um, it's kind of a joke among my friends that it takes me forever to get anything done. And I'm going to just tell that quick story of a set of four chairs I made for my house um, that took even longer than usual and had more detours. So 
if you don't feel like you're crushing this whole coronavirus quarantine thing, then you're not the, the lean, mean productivity machine that you feel you should be. This might make you feel better about yourself. All right, Leah, kick it. So this is probably the first chair I ever made. It was uh, sort of one of the early models I was thinking about doing for this, uh, this project. Um, it's just in Poplar, it wasn't a final prototype, but it was sort of getting in the direction that I was trying to go. And I was getting all set to make it when this happened, and I wound up in the hospital with a badly broken leg, um, thanks to going to Ajax on closing day. And, um, and I had plenty of time in the hospital, and afterwards, I couldn't really walk for almost a year afterwards, uh, to look at the chair and decide I didn't want to make it or anything like it. So I uh, went to the ranch and I sprawled in a lawn chair in uh, Michael Fortune's class and did a whole bunch of um, uh, little models. This little guy is about eight inches tall. And I was just exploring concepts. And when I could finally work again in my shop, almost you know, nine months later, I started working on building some prototypes. And this is a, a kind of way that you build chairs with a framework that you can then assemble parts on it. And as I was doing this, I realized that what I wanted to do was too complex to really cut by hand. So I spent another six months or so teaching myself how to do three-dimensional CAD CAM modeling and how to cut parts on a CNC router, which you see here. Um, and here I'm just trying to cut the legs. That was my original idea, because that's the hardest part. And then I convinced myself that I could actually model the whole chair in the, the, the 3D design tool, and I could cut all of the parts, all nine of them, um, using the CNC router. So that kind of became the goal of the project. Um, and once I had an initial model, I started making prototypes. This is one of the very first ones in the ugliest wood I could find, so I wouldn't feel bad about um, chopping it up as soon as I was finished with it. And I made a whole bunch of these, probably about six of them over the course of the next few months. Um, this is one that didn't survive. Um, and as I was doing this, I was also getting a lot better at machining the parts and using the tools. Um, so you can see here, one of the innovations was these mounting boards. Um, every part, sometimes they're cut in pairs, had a custom mounting board that I could use to align it. The prototypes were getting better and they were getting closer to what it was that I thought I wanted to make. Um, I was trying to go for something that was more sculptural, had more flowing lines, um, just kind of more curvy in general. These were kind of dangerous because I'd make them and I wouldn't glue them together. I'd just leave them sitting around in my house and people would try and sit in them. Um, I eventually decided to make an advanced prototype and I actually glued it together. And you can see here the difficulty of clamping together a chair that doesn't have any straight lines or flat surfaces on it anywhere. So you have to make your own. And that's the advanced prototype in Beechwood. Um, which was pretty close to what I wanted, what I had in mind. It's not quite right, but it was close enough that I decided to make four of them in my final wood in walnut, this beautiful, you know, air-dried California walnut that I had. And I was still getting better at manufacturing stuff. You can see here's another innovation. Those little uh, guides mount, mounted to the edge of this uh, crest rail with slots in it that I could use. Those were cut on the CNC machine, uh, glued onto the ends of the part, and then I could use it to align it, the other tools that I was using. Uh, here you can see the CNC finishing a seat. On the left, it's done the rough cut to hog away the rough, the rough material, and on the right, it's doing its finishing pass. It's an incredible tool for doing these complex three-dimensional shapes. And that's the final chair that uh, eventually came out. And I have to say, when I was finished, I wasn't entirely happy. I was sort of disappointed in the way they came out. It wasn't bad, um, but I kept thinking about ways that I could have made it better. Uh, but then kind of over time, I kind of uh, came to enjoy some of the parts that I thought did work out well. Um, and I came to realize that it was just another sort of stop along a journey that would continue, maybe not in reality, but in kind of my imagination into the future. That's it, thanks. Hi, I'm Meg Riley, and I'm going to give a presentation on historic conservation and restoration. All right. I'm ready. All right, so my story begins um, with kind of the cliche study abroad program as a student that was eating too much gelato and pizza. I was lucky enough to participate in a program that was mostly in situ, meaning that we were always having class in a different location, whether it was a museum or a church, um, just not in a classroom. Most of the time, my classes were in churches. And here you can see an image inside the church of Santa Maria, Maria Novella. And here you can see someone working on a mural. 
this was an incredible sight to me because I'd never seen anyone restoring a piece of artwork on site in person. I just remember going to museums and seeing uh, little signs posted when a piece of artwork was moved to another location. And sometimes they'd even put a piece of artwork um, as a replica in place of that. And I was lucky enough a year later to do a program called San Gemini Preservations. It's in Umbria, Italy. Here you see a picture of my roommate. Um, she was working on a, a gesso um, of fresco. And here I'm learning how to make paper. And this program offered many different areas of focus. We focused on art restoration in terms of bookmaking and bookbinding, and also in painting and building conservation. And here you can see an image of a 16th century document that we worked on. And before I go further, I just want to talk about the difference between conservation and restoration. Conservation is the prevention and safeguarding activities aimed at ensuring for an unlimited period the material integrity of the object. So the object remains virtually untouched, relatively the same. Whereas in restoration, it's based on the principles of conservation and all previously acquired knowledge. The aim is to return the object to a known or even original state. And one unique thing about Italy and about their restoration and conservation processes is they actually have what's called the Italian Restoration Charter of 1987. To this day, it's the most comprehensive piece of legislation in the world dealing with cultural heritage, both in terms of the range of fields it covers and its details. And you might be wondering why I didn't pursue this field professionally. Well, in the United States, not only are you required to have a Bachelor of Art in Art History or in studio art, you also have to have a bachelor's of science in chemistry to even be considered for a program like this. So if you take anything away from this presentation, it's that if you know a young artist or someone who loves making things and loves science, maybe encourage them to look at art restoration. And also you could use this time at home to go through your own documents and your own photos and Google maybe a few ways to preserve your own treasures at home. Thank you. All right, hey everyone. Uh, I'm Zakria. I'm the Studio Coordinator of Sculpture at Anderson Ranch. Uh, so I'm just gonna give a quick little intro. In 2019, I was able to experience a ton of new uh, things for the first time. And when I was asked to do this presentation, it got me thinking, what other things have I done for the first time? And do I have any documentation of it? And considering what's going on right now, never experiencing something like this, uh, I thought it would be a good time. So because I'm giving a lecture about my work through the same platform in a couple of weeks, hope to see you there. Uh, I And I have a love for storytelling. I thought I'd you know give this presentation and give a chance to reflect on my past first time experiences and how they've influenced who I am today. All right, Leah, let's go. Okay, so when I was a baby, uh, the first time I, this is the first time I ever wore a headband. My mom put it on because I was an escape artist and I would hit my head on a lot of things when I would climb out. So she wanted to protect my head uh, from those instances. Uh, this is the first time I made art, I think. Uh, I think it's a finger painting. My mom had it framed and then a couple years back when we helped her move, we found it and I just thought that it was pretty amazing that I had you know, embarked on this art career and found this piece of art. Whew. So first time I ever did a live performance, uh, I was Scary Spice in the town show in high school. Shout out JP. Uh, we took third place and we sang If You Want to Be My Lover. Pretty great. Uh, this is the first time I drove a car overseas. My dad was working overseas and he has a love for like really frosty coffees. 
And so when I started driving, he spilled it all over and he was so upset and it was just so funny. I couldn't get over it. Okay, this is the first time that I did my oil change. I over tightened the nut and broke the nut inside the vehicle. So I had to learn what an easy out was and it, I turned a 30 minute job into like a three hour job and it, it was miserable. This is the first time I broke a bone uh, on the right. This is right after I got my cast, I broke my leg skating. And on the left, I was six weeks out from the cast and I didn't want to go back to the doctor. So I cut it off myself. Probably not a great idea. Uh, so I thought this was funny. So when Instagram came out, this is the first meme uh, that I ever posted. And this is like when memes were becoming popular and they were popping up everywhere. And I still agree with the statement. This is the first concert I ever went to. I was asked randomly by a friend to go with him and we went to a Modest Yahoo concert. I ended up getting on stage, I ended up helping him with the stage dive and it was pretty spectacular. Uh, what else we got? Okay, so this is the first time I got a ticket for speeding on my longboard. Uh, apparently I was going too fast and I got pulled over by a motorcycle cop and he told me that I was cooking and that I needed to not do that again. So he wrote me up and yeah. Um, so I'm an avid volleyball player. I really love playing beach volleyball. It's been a big part of my life and I take it seriously, but this was the first time I drank before a tournament and it was, <laughs> it was a terrible idea and that was what I looked like. So this is the first selfie I ever took uh, with my dad. This is for his 50th birthday and I just thought it was a cool time. Like it, it captured a lot of our relationship and I also saw a little, a lot of similarities between our facial features. This is the first art show I was ever in. Uh, I was asked to be in. I was selected out of all the schools in Florida to show at the Atlantic Center for the Arts in New Smyrna Beach. And it really kind of kicked off my career and things that I'm doing nowadays. Uh, I really like graffiti, especially bathroom graffiti. So this is the first photo I took of something that I found that I just thought was great. And I really enjoy wordplay. So it kind of you know appeased me in a multitude of ways. So last year we moved to Colorado. It was the first time I had ever been to Colorado. Uh, we drove from Florida. We accidentally drove this truck over Independence Pass, which is like over 12,000 feet. And it's like a single lane road and we had no idea. So it was very sketchy. Lastly, this is a piece, um, my first residency. It's about 28 feet tall. It's called There's Always a Link. And I was just so excited to be in the residency and make something that was that big. It was super cool. All right, thanks. You guys hear me? Um, hi, my name is Esther. I, um, I'm the studio coordinator of photography and new media here at Anderson Ranch. Um, and my presentation, I'm going to try and squeeze in um, how photography helped shape the national park system um, in uh, 225 seconds. So, Leah, whenever you're ready. Uh, this image is the first viable photograph taken in 1827 by Joseph Neeps. This heliograph process in which a plate was made light sensitive and exposed using a camera obscura, which is a dark room with a hole in a window, was the beginning of a new medium. This daguerreotype of Henry David Thoreau, who published On Walden Pond in 1854, is important to this presentation because he represents the philosophy of the transcendentalists. This philosophy regarding nature was a guiding light for the future pioneers of landscape photography. Photography evolved into the wet plate collodion process. This image taken by Watkins was instrumental in Abraham Lincoln signing the Yosemite land grant in 1864 amidst the Civil War, mostly because people had started to move to the valley and <coughs> build commercial businesses. About 10 years later, Ferdinand Hayden put together an expedition um, along with other surveyors and botanists and Henry, uh, he brought along William Henry Jackson, who was a painter and a photographer. This next image is a, uh, taken by Jackson of his assistant and a pack mule full of his photographic equipment, which consisted of 40 separate items and weighing around 300 pounds. His process required glass plates being prepared in the dark minutes before and being developed after. And the photographs taken on this expedition resulted in a monograph that landed on each congressman's desk with printed photographs and captions by Jackson. And uh, the result of that was in 1872, the Yellowstone National Park was officially formed. The monograph contained images like this of the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone. Each photograph was hand printed from the large plates 
that were exposed on the expedition and somehow made it down the mountain on a pack mule unbroken, which um, is pretty amazing. Uh, the first photograph of Old Faithful erupting by Jackson in 1872. The monograph contains several images that have humans as reference for the scale and magnitude of the landscape. Without these men standing at the base of the eruption in the photo, the water might be lost, the height of the water might be lost on the viewer. George Alexander Grant had worked at a ranger in Yellowstone uh, in the early 1920s and had slowly started taking photographs. He left to teach photography, but when the opportunity came for him to to become the first chief photographer of the National Park Service, he took it in 1931. The black lines on this map refer to the travel that Grant did photographing the many parks in the country. They were at the mercy of the Park Service and were used as stamps, brochures, magazine, guidebooks, museum exhibitions, and all sorts of other things. Um, it might be considered rude to not mention the father of modern landscape photography, Ansel Adams, he was educated mostly by his father, who was a true believer in the transcendental philosophy. He instilled, that Ansel, he instilled in Ansel the belief that nature gave men more than a church could provide. Around the time that Adams was producing some of his greatest work, uh, engineering of roads made parks more access accessible, which increased uh, travel to all these great locations around our country. But let's go back before Yellowstone and even before Yosemite Valley in 1832, which was the first land ever protected by the federal government for recreational use. It was land that was said to contain sacred healing powers that should be safeguarded from commercial exploitation. Land that was once called the Valley of the Vapors was discovered on an expedition that was investigating the reaches of the Louisiana Purchase. These healing waters of what is now Hot Springs, Arkansas, were home to the Quapaw and Caddo Native Americans that use this land to live and heal. Photographs, historical and contemporary, continue to educate, bear witness, draw attention to these places we have fought to protect for hundreds of years. Even though these lands were safeguarded by our government long before the National Park Service was officially formed, the land and the photographs paved a way for the protection of these natural areas in which we take so much pride. The end. Okay, can you hear me? Great. Um, I'm Joshua Rashad McFadden and I am based in Rochester, New York. Um, and I'll be talking about two of my projects, um, Come to Selfhood and Evidence. Okay. I started a project called Come to Selfhood in 2015 because I wanted to begin to use a collaborative approach to tell stories of young black men and their ideas of living in America, masculinity, role models and perceptions of the black male. In 2012, the murder of Trayvon Martin was a moment that changed my generation's notions of freedom here in America. I distinctly remember the conversations surrounding the black male and the black hoodie. And I thought to myself, what can I do? Why are black men perceived as a threat no matter what they do? I was inspired by my brothers um, and I have three brothers and we all have very different personalities. I also began to question the role that imagery plays in shaping ideas of the black man. Furthermore, furthermore who controls this image? So with Come to Selfhood, I collected archival images of father figures and paired them with contemporary portraits that I made of their sons, along with collected handwritten narratives about experiences. The result is a collective story you can't ignore. After the release of Come to Selfhood, I started to explore this idea of the black masculine identity and now gender. And I started at Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia an HBCU or historically black college or university that's also an all male school. So I was beginning to not only look at identity construction, but also the fact that these men are coming to self within an institution known for developing historical conservative black male leaders such as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And then them having to identify or not with that legacy. Uh, the prompt for this section of the project was, I am a man, which is a slogan from, from the sanitation workers strike in Memphis, Tennessee, which was the last demonstration for Dr. King before his assassination. Uh, so now I'm thinking about this archive that I've built um, and will continue to build, seeing photography as evidence, and in this case, evidence of being and evidence of becoming. 
I wanted to take another approach to presenting this information that I've collected, um, giving more importance to the handwritten narratives and, and how they're collected and saved and archived. So I worked with Visual Studies Workshop in Rochester, New York on a public arts project. We published a newspaper called Evidence that has been distributed throughout the city. This newspaper is inspired by Frederick Douglass's North Star newspaper that was also published in Rochester, New York in the 1800s. Evidence is also an exhi uh, exhibition that opened in February 2020. In this exhi uh, exhibition, you'll see all of the work and how it comes together, and also original editions of the North Star newspaper. The Evidence newspaper have uh, special dispensers around the city for people to access, and here's one that's placed in the gallery space. And I'll end with a cover of the newspaper, and I thank you all for listening. Really, really excited to have all of you uh, present. Thank you, thank you so much. Everyone is clapping, just they're, they're, uh, they're on mute. So feel <laughs> the applause and the love. Um, I've got a few people who have put in some uh, questions in the Q&A for the, um, for the audience, and there's about 160 or 70 of you out there. You'll see at the bottom of your screen a small uh, icon where you can enter a Q&A question, or you can raise your hand, and in a few minutes we'll pass to Esther and she'll slowly uh, work through the people who have, who have submitted questions. Uh, so thank you all uh, for that. Um, I found some really interesting themes as I, as I listened to each of you. Um, one, uh, just sort of the, a, a balance between exploring the familiar and then that explanation of the unknown, the unknown, and that circle back uh, to the familiar again. And uh, I found that kind of a, an interesting theme, and we'll we'll touch back on that in a moment. Uh, a lot about home and away. What when people travel, and then also that exploration outwardly, I found fascinating. Um, some real themes crossing through about uh, recording the present, but also preserving history. Uh, as we looked at, say, Meg's preservation documents versus. Uh, Ed's recording of um, the COVID diary, which I found quite fascinating, but also throughout very much um, storytelling and, um, and and sort of humanizing of those stories, whether whether we look at Joshua's uh, recording of, of Black Lives or whether we look at uh, Ben's recording of uh, Native American women. And I, I found all of those just really interesting crossing themes that are going to give me a lot to think about uh, for the next two, few days. But Maybe what I'd like to start out a little bit with is, is maybe, Ben, if I could get you to unmute, um, tell us a little bit more about um, kind of the ongoing nature of your project and, and maybe in a little bit of a light reflecting on, uh, on Joshua's um, presentation. And then, Joshua, I'm going to ask you to respond to Ben, if that's all right, and, and maybe reflect a little bit on his approach to documenting his, his process. Sure. Yeah, right now uh, I currently just finished building two 32 by 40 inch light panels so I can work on much larger butterfly portraits. The, everyone that you saw there was six inches by eight inches or smaller. So the ones I'm working on now are now 24 by 36, but I had to basically build all the equipment to get up to that scale. So I've just started Rita and she's Osage. Um, if you... Uh, a good book to read during right now would be Killers of the Flower Moon. Um, if you haven't, it's a really good piece of undocumented history. Um, I highly suggest that, but she comes from that book. And um, was the second part of your question, like how would I bring it forward? Yeah, so I think those original butterfly portraits with the large scale photographs, with, to answer Andrea's question, some sound bites or some interviews or email correspondence that I've had with family members directly during this whole process has been uh, the greatest impact for me. And I think that would be a good thing to share with uh, future audiences and galleries or different ways to pre present these. So.
All right, Joshua, we'll pass to you. I'd love to, to hear kind of your thoughts a little bit on, on um, the next steps for your project, but also kind of reflecting on connections between you and, and Ben's work. Oh, great. Yeah, well, there's definitely, as far as the connections, there's definitely a connection as uh, far as the family aspect of the projects goes and the physical element of actually building and creating something and putting it um, in an outdoor space. And so um, that's really what I wanted to bring to my project as far as the dispensers goes with the newspapers and having those fabricated so that um, a larger audience and the public can uh, interact with, with the work. Excellent. I think uh, another one that really struck me were some of the connections between uh, Wendy's uh, story about taking on a new challenge and how that started to tie back uh, to her own work and then her work exploring the, the kind of building of those drums. And, uh, and Zach's um, talking about his own firsts in life and the challenges and barriers um, that that face. Uh, Zach got a little shout out on the uh, Q&A thing from uh, Michael Stevenson, who, uh, who asked a similar question. Uh, basically talking about what are the biggest uh, obstacles that artists face uh, when taking on a new first. So uh, both Wendy and Zach, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that idea of, of what are the challenges and what are the, what are the rewards of, of undertaking a new, a new challenge. Zach, why don't we start with you and then we'll go to Wendy. Sure. Uh, I mean, starting something new for the first time is terrifying. That's why I picked a lot of things that I didn't know was my first time. But uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of it's like a leap of faith. There's a lot of fear. Uh, there's the potential, you know, to put yourself out there and be vulnerable. But, you know, you try to think about all the consequences, everything that could happen. You try to understand all the parameters. And then you, sometimes you just say, screw it, like go for it. So, I mean, that's been a big component in my life is being young and having, you know, large aspirations and then just like going for it. And I don't, you know, if I get rejected, okay, put it to the side and do something else. And apply for something really big, apply for something really small, or do something locally, or do something overseas. It's just, you just have to try. You know, it's the attempt that counts, and it's going to make you better. Well, Wendy, we'll pass to you. Um, I, I, I guess I really identify with what uh, Zach just said about uh, just trying. Um, I, I, my practice is, you know, I guess a little bit on the uh, Oh, I don't know, scatterbrained uh, side because it's kind of all I do. I consistently kind of find myself trying something new. And um, I think in many ways, this uh, exploration of drumming, I think at first it was just a way to kind of uh, recenter my attention. And I wanted to find something that would keep me um, like a meditation almost. Like dr when you're drumming, you can't really think about anything else. And after the election in 2016, <laughs> I kind of needed something to uh, meditate with. And so drumming was kind of where I found, found that kind of uh, peace. But then, I mean, uh, my work has always been uh, this kind of um, diving into something terribly scary. And, and so I've found myself taking on projects that are um, unnerving things that I have never done before. Um, found myself in enormous public art projects that scare the living daylights out of me, or um, in this case, doing a drum solo uh, for the first time. And so um, to me, one of the beautiful things about being an artist is that you have the permission to do that. And uh, I feel like my career is sort of based on being uh, being uh, in this sort of very privileged position of being able to scare the crap out of myself um, <laughs> for a living in my work. And so, uh, yeah, so uh, and making a drum was a little bit like that, too. I just was definitely out of my depth. And I guess that's where I thrive on many levels. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, Meg, if I can, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to you quickly. Um, I was really uh, fascinated by your, the restoration project, but also that way of, of looking differently at, at a career or at an interest and finding that passion in, in both art and science as an opportunity. And, and, and that sort of finding a new challenge related in my mind a little bit to, to Zach's exploration of the new, 
uh, and the first um, and Wendy's. Tell us a little bit about um, that kind of way of, of using an experience to change perspective. Well, I guess I would just build off of what Zach was saying and just putting yourself out there and exploring and you never know what you might discover. I, I never ever thought I would be in Italy working on 15th, 16th century documents. Um, but I also never would have discovered that if I hadn't done a study abroad program in the first place. Um, so I just think, I think exploring and learning is, it's a really important process of being human. Fantastic. Esther, I'm going to jump to you real quick. Um, I, I was kind of fascinated thinking about Ed's, um, Ed's documenting a current event and, and this sort of historical understanding of how that documentation created sort of huge social change or huge uh, cultural change in the creation of the park system. And just would love to hear your, your kind of reflections, thinking both about uh, Ed's and documenting a current event and your experience and in, in history uh, with that topic. Sure, I think, I mean, I, I think the important thing is, is that we just keep documenting no matter what. And I, I mean, I think that's what Ed is doing and I think it's fantastic. And then I think these moments we can look back on in, you know, a hundred years or 50 years and, and really then I think more meditation um, comes from learning what happened in the past. And I think I, that's why I think it's so important that no matter if you know where your images are going to land or what you're going to do with them, but just to keep pushing forward and to keep documenting. So, yeah. All right, John, we're going to, or Ed, we're going to come to you in just a minute um, with the last question. But while we think about that study of that idea of being at home and looking um, uh, and, and being out and exploring, which is, is so tied to your career, I wanted to kind of quickly touch back to John and this exploration of just a really domestic object. And yet that being at home and studying that and that kind of going out and looking at anything and that coming back and that experimentation and challenging and that learning experience. So John, if I could pass to you, um, nothing more uh, complicated uh, or more simple than a chair. So tell us a little bit about that idea of, of being home and being confined, um, being able to work and then being uh, injured and having to, um, to separate yourself and think through it and then come back with a different approach. Yeah, it seems curiously appropriate to the times we find ourselves in that, uh, you know, the path that you're, you're following, whatever it is, whether it's a big theme in your life or just a small thing like making a piece of furniture that, you know, suddenly it gets disrupted and you're completely spun off into a totally different direction. Um, you know, and I used to say after, after I got hurt, you know, that there's no such thing as a silver lining because it was a horrible experience. And if I could go back and not have it happen, I would definitely do that. But it did happen and it, you know, it just caused this big change. Um, but then it just opened up all these new avenues for exploration and things I would have never done otherwise. And you know, whether you're sitting, whether the whole world is available to you or just you know, the six feet around you, you know, when you are like when you're injured, uh, there's still sort of a whole universe of possibilities in that space, however big or small it is. Um, and you find that you know, each little step leads to 10 more steps. And so that was kind of the experience that I, that I learned from that whole, that whole thing. Fantastic, thank you. I've got two more questions that were submitted on the Q&A. If, um, if you wanna submit a question on the q and I'll read it. If you wanna raise your hand, I'm gonna to pass to Esther after these two questions. Uh, this one goes to you, Ed. Um, uh, can you talk more about being a photojournalist in the time of not being able to travel or go on assignment and choosing to make work closer to home? Is this a challenging time for photojournalism? Journalists who may want to go, may want to be working more and can't, or should they find opportunities at home? Well, this is, those are big questions. Um, so I might have to, I might ask you to rephrase some of them, but I would say it's, um, it's an absolutely terrible time for, for not just photojournalists, but let's focus on, on them because by the nature of what we do, um, you know, we need to move, we need access, we need to get close to people. So it's quite a challenge. Um, and, you know, I know so many people who are suffering uh, within the profession. I mean, for me, I have um, I've done a lot of work in my home in the past. So I um, looking around aging, an aging parent, and and so I I have some familiarity with working not only around the world but within my own home. 
and so there is a comfort zone. Uh, there's a comfort level for me in doing that. Um, it's also, you know, look, it's really simple. I realized like within the first three or four days of this, that for me, every day I need to do something that has meaning and purpose. And that could be volunteering or it could be, you know, documenting and using my, my, my passion and my skills. So I am, I, while I am making absolutely no money right now and sort of going, not going broke, but you know, and that, that part of it is very stressful, but I'm not focusing on that. What I'm focusing on is this, um, you know, as I say we're living in history right now, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's incredible what's going on and devastating and scary. And we don't know when it's going to end and, and the, the culprit, we can't see it, smell it, taste it, touch it. Well, I guess it can touch us. So anyway, with all these things in mind, you know, I am trying to utilize the sort of skills and, and the passion and the gen, genuine curiosity that I have to do whatever I can. So in this case, it's working very close to home. And it's something I like to emphasize, especially when I teach or mentor, is that there is nothing wrong with working hyper locally. You know, some of the greatest people we may meet, some of the greatest things we may witness or learn are often just within our midst. So while photojournalism is about going out in the world and, and all that, you can also practice that just literally in your own home. Fantastic. I've got uh, another question from Andrea. Uh, she's the one who prompted that question for, uh, for Ed. This one is for you, Joshua. Uh, can you talk about your photographs in terms of the history of photography as document, as well as how to sit in contemporary conversations around image making and storytelling? Um, sure. Uh, I guess I can, hmm, to make it a short answer. Andrea asked the hard question. Here for, so we're not here for hours. Um, as far as my imagery goes, I always like to go back to um, Frederick Douglass and his use of the photograph but not only as, not only as um, you know, a keepsake, but as a, as a tool, um, as a documentation, as an archive, but as a tool to change perceptions of Black Americans in the 1800s. And we have to think about photography and who actually had access to photography because that was before um, you know, the, the democratization of photography. So if you look at Frederick Douglass and how he was actually um, a former slave, someone who freed himself from slavery, but then got access to photography and became one of the most photographed men of the, or the most photographed man of the 19th century. That's what I look at um, as far as the history of the photograph. And then I take that history and apply it to my projects as far as come to selfhood to say, okay, I can still use um, the method of portraiture um, to still change um, perceptions of black men and black people in general um, in, you know, in 2020. And so that's why I wanted to take that image and then flip it on its head and say, let's, well, let's um, uh, reposition these narratives and reposition these, um, uh, this archive and um, stories that have been provided to further push the idea that um, we can own our narrative and then we can also publish them. Fantastic. Esther, I'm going to let you take the, the hand that's been raised as the next question, and then we'll come back and I have a few more. Can you hear me? <laughs> um, we have one person who raised their hand, Meredith uh, Nemiroff. I'm going to allow you to talk, you, and that way you can um, ask your question. Can you go ahead and speak? Yes, um, this is a question for you, Esther. Oh, sure. Um, <laughs> I love your presentation. Thank I'm very you. familiar with a lot of um, work from the 1800s that helped, early 1900s that helped establish the national park system. And I wondered um, how you could do that today, how you could support the national park system in a present contemporary way. Yeah, that's keep it, a keep it going. <laughs> I think the national parks are in a lot of trouble at this moment mm -hmm. in many ways. So I wondered what you would propose. 
Um, honestly, my, I hate to say this, but my first instinct is to say, don't go. <laughs> but <laughs> I know that's kind of like the opposite of, you know, praising nature, but it is, um, I think the national parks, I think that they need to really reevaluate how many visitors they have every year and maybe a way to control it. Um, that way we could, that way it could, you know, do less damage to the actual nature that we're trying to protect. Um, but yeah, I think that's a really, it's a good question. And it's a really, I think it's, I don't have an answer, but I think that sometimes preserving nature is like, okay, well, do I really, do I need to drive 10,000 miles to get to one place? Or, and then do I need to, you know, post everything on Instagram and then just draw more attack, mm -hmm. attraction? Um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, but sometimes I really, it's hard for me to go to national parks because it's, it destroys it inevitably, but that's kind of true for any, any place in nature. So it's kind of double, double edge. I don't, I probably didn't even answer the question, but that was just my thoughts. <laughs> something to think about. <laughs> for sure. It's a, it's a really, it's a hard, um, like I, I really love the history of the national park system. And, um, I think in its, in its genesis, it was, it had a really good, intent but i feel now especially in contemporary times that these parks have sort of become what they were what they were protected against so it's a really it's it's a hard um it's a hard thing to think about but yeah uh, john okay. if you could hit on mute i believe you had a question uh for joshua yeah hey joshua um i just loved your work i, I couldn't stop looking at the, your photographs and they're so beautiful. It was, um, you know, and not just sort of technically perfect, but there's a kind of like warmth and engagement with your subjects that really came through. And Thank I was you. just wondering, like, how you feel, because not everybody makes beautiful photographs or even tries to make beautiful photographs. And I was just wondering, you know, what does that, what does your attempt to make beauty, you know, how does that sort of play into the work that you're doing? Hmm. Well, Good question. <laughs> I think that, you know, this idea of, you know, uh, beauty for a long time, uh, it was, it was not, not allowed for, let's say, black photographers. Um, and, you know, a lot of, I've heard a lot, you know, especially like in grad school, you know, don't just make a beautiful photograph. Um, usually directed at, directed at me. So I had to kind of shift my idea about, you know, what, why, why, why am I constantly like being told not to focus on beauty? Um, but then I saw, you know, a book, a book by Deborah Willis, um, Posing Beauty. And that changed, that shifted my idea of beauty in the photograph again, because it was a book, um, again, about the history of photography, but um, the posing of, of black bodies um, in a beautiful manner from archival images to the vernacular image, you know, the everyday image to professional photographers. Um, and so for me, uh, really it's, it's, it's a thing that's instilled in every, every photo I take, I, I think, you know, I try to see beauty in every situation. And so that's how I approach photography. Uh, Esther, I believe we have another uh, participant that wanted to ask a question and then we'll have one kind of, I'll have one closing question for the group um, um, at the end. Yeah, someone raised their hand, but then they took it away. Um, Daniel, do you still want to raise your hand and ask think, a question? I think their question's in the chat. If you, It is. Oh, oh. There. I, I'm not sure who it's directed to. Um, oh, wait, here we go. I'll let him talk and then he can ask. There we go. Daniel, are you there? There we go. Yep. Okay. Awesome. Uh, my my question is um, for Joshua came to mind, but other people as well. How has being sheltered changed your process on a on a day to day way? Has is being in exile good for you? Is is it helping in terms of making your art? Um. <laughs> uh, yes and no. I think, I think, has it, has it helped? No. I mean, I, you know, I can't really make photographs of people. Um, but my process is very slow to begin with. It's just only gotten slower. 
Um, so I'm working with images already I, I've already made, you know, um, that's on my hard drives, going back and looking at things from the past uh, and just trying to engage with those images more, um, experimenting with self-portraiture and so on. I have to say, I saw that message pop up in the Q&A and I was saving it for our closing question. So maybe we'll just move from Joshua. Do any of the other panelists want to talk just for a moment about the experience of being sheltered, how it's influenced how they think or, or their process uh, or, or how they're approaching um, art or life? I mean, I'm on Zoom all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's your new process. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Zach, thoughts about being sheltered? Yeah, uh, it's tough, you know? I, you know, you're working from home, my wife and I are both working and it, it affects, you know, as, as a sculptor and, you know, working in, with installation and not having a shop, it's really difficult to do anything. And last year I was in a similar situation where I didn't have a shop at, at all. So it was bittersweet because, you know, a lot of being an artist is, being on the computer, editing your work, writing your statements, you know, putting together proposals, grants, doing your research. So it, it allows more time for that and become more of a professional, uh, maybe. And it gives you a lot of ideas so that when you get back to the studio, you can really hash them out. Um, but other than that, it's, it's hard being, you know, feeling restricted, you know, and having that kind of sense. Fantastic. Um... Wendy, I think if you if you tilt your screen enough, we can see your drum set. Do you want to tell us a little bit about being uh, confined? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, one of the great things about being confined is that um, I'm, I'm finding lots of other people are doing what I did, which is to take up a musical instrument. And um, so um, I, I, I actually do have time to play during the day. And, um, and sometimes it's a really good break from the other kinds of work that I have to do, which keep me very uh, connected to the computer. Um, but some of the things that Zach was talking about, this kind of, um, you know, the sort of nuts and bolts business of being an artist. One of the things that I found really good about this time is to reflect a little bit and to um, think about my practice, um, like the arc of my practice over time. And Andrea had asked me if I felt like um, this work has any connection to some of my earlier work, which was uh, uh, pretty performative and um, sort of concerned with, I don't know, feminist uh, figures. And it, and it absolutely does. And I think this time that I'm, uh, uh, I have to be at home and, and reflect on my practice as an artist has been pretty productive. Uh, ben, any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I, we, we literally moved into our house on March 1st, which was crazy. So I have a chance now to unpack a lot of boxes and do a lot of things that I would do only on the weekend. So uh, I've gotten a lot of things done around the house, a lot of projects that Tiffany, my wife, has wanted me to do as well. She's now working from home. Um, we try to stay positive every morning. Like how Ed said, you wake up, see how you're doing, and then just like jump into the day. And I, I try not to let it affect me too much, except when I read the New York Times or NPR or CNN News or Fox News. And then I like try to, and then I block that out. And then I go right back into the studio. And then I, I work on the studio and then I do email correspondence and then I grade papers for my students because we've shifted completely online, ASU has. So I grade like, you know, 300 papers online now, which is fine. But I, I manage the day, you know, so uh, for me, it's, I'm, do, I'm doing great, so. Um, Meg, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your experience on, uh, on the uh, coronavirus and being uh, isolated? Might, might have lost her. Sorry, oh. I, I'm here. Well, it's interesting for me because um, I'm working from home most of the time, but I also come into the, the office and I'm, I'm actually here right now. And it's, it's very 
um, strange and unsettling to be in the building when it's so empty. Um, so I guess when I'm here, I usually just try to get in and out and then go home where it's a little more comforting. And, and like Ben said, just really trying to take it day at, a day at a time. Fantastic. John, could I ask, ask you next to share some thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I already spoke about this idea of, you know, dislocation and how your plans change and, you know, suddenly your, you know, reality shifts for you. And I think that's pretty much how I'm dealing with it. I guess I'll say that, you know, one of the great things about getting older is like, you have so much more time in your life for bad things to have happened to you. And uh, so you can kind of evaluate any tipping situation against, you know, your history. So I don't know whether that's a good thing or not. And John and I both share the challenge of having a school aged child at home. So uh it's 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 a little chaos in my house i'm, I'm sure emma, uh, emma's keeping you busy uh esther i think i'm i'm up to you and then i'll finish with ed um sure i i mean i'm fortunate enough to live where i work and so my my routine hasn't shifted you know in in terms of like location wise but i do have to say like not having people here at the ranch it is certainly it's eerie and it you know like meg was saying it's like it's a it's unsettling, but I also just, I miss, you know, having meetings in person with my coworkers and um, being able to have that interaction. And, um, you know, our apartment has never been cleaner. Um, I've never reorganized so many things so many times. So that's kind of uh, keep it be busy. But um, it's really, you know, working through this time, it's, it's kind of been a, a, a really amazing thing because it keeps, keeps my schedule. It keeps me going. It keeps me interacting with people and, um, I also, I also, uh, I have a lot of family who work in the medical community, and I think my <clears throat> my level of worry for them has gone up quite a bit because they, um, you know, they're on the front lines. So I, I think about them all the time. So yeah, but yeah. Fantastic, yeah. Ed. We'll conclude with you, and I'd love just your your thoughts on um, on this process and how how we've worked um, through all these ideas and connected. Okay, so you know. I'm normally on, on the road eight months out of the year. So in our 29 year relationship, myself and Julie, this is the most time we've actually ever spent together. And believe it or not, she is not sick of me. We're actually doing well. So I am uh, take great solace in that uh, because I can be a really annoying bugger. But anyway, but um, you know, I think for me, um, and also we n normally have anywhere from three to four people who work with us in our home studio. And so they're not coming in. So it's a, it's very quiet. And there are aspects of that that are really quite wonderful. Not that the folks aren't coming, but that, you know, we can wake up a little later, whatever. We can sort of set our own pace. Um, I will say, um, unfortunately, I am not finding the peace that I, that everyone else is finding right now. I'm still, I'm so driven. Um, I'm just so driven. I think what this is showing me is that this is who I am. Uh, for better or worse, and that I am wired that's in my DNA to be engaged with the world to try to understand what's going on in this case right around me because I am in the epicenter of this and we're very close to it. So, you know, having said that, uh, I've also gardened for the first time uh, and with my wife. I'm doing things that that I haven't done that she wishes I had done decades ago, <laughs> anyway. And, uh, you know, I am finding ways to you know sort of simple pleasures you know cooking and working the garden and and just taking care of our 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 lives our space speaking to our kids every day these are all things that now are imbued with so much more meaning and they don't have to be rushed which is a beautiful thing um so you know just to sort of wrap this up i guess or or just uh you know, I guess my main concern is that um, everybody just stays safe and we, 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 we're smart in how we behave and, and uh, you know, that we, we will prevail. We will prevail, but it's not going to happen in, in the next weeks. You know, it's going to take a while. So, and thank you so much. It's an honor to be with all of you guys and some I know and some I don't. And uh, anyway, thank you so much. Well, I could not close better than with those words. So I'm gonna thank all of our panelists. I really appreciate uh, all you've, you've done to be here. I really wanna shout out to, to Esther and, and Leah and Andrea who 
do all the work to put this together. They're really just phenomenal colleagues and they're bringing the, the ranch into its, its new form with all these digital connections. Uh, excited about upcoming events. Uh, Louise De La Way will be doing our next uh, art salon. Uh, Zach, as he mentioned, will be coming up after her. Uh, every third Thursday is Thinker Thursday, so we look forward to seeing you next month. Uh, and again, um, please uh, stay involved with the ranch, stay connected with people. Humanizing is something that almost every story came up today had to do with. Uh, stay connected, stay connected with the ranch, and uh, go make some great art. Thank you all. Have a really great night. Thanks, Peter.